which may be confusing the uh, administrators a bit. But I've told them I talk about data breaches and password hashes, and I will. But I got more time than I expected, which is good because last week we finally got another attack working, which is a lot of fun. And so we're running around here with a lot of stuff, hopefully going to demonstrate it live. We'll see if we can make it work. Anyway, so um, I'm Sam Bound. I teach at City College San Francisco, about which you're going to hear a lot more than any sensible institution would let you hear. Um, because I, for some reason, the people that hate me are public about it. They say what they want to say out loud, publish it in the newspaper. There's no secrets. Any sensible group, I'd have confidentiality agreements and everything else. But I don't have to worry about that because my enemies are proud of saying terrible things. So I, I don't have to conceal it or clean it up. So here's what happened. Start of this year. The front page of the San Francisco Chronicle said, we had been breached. Worst data breach in history uh, or something to, uh, like that. We have 10,000 machines. They're all infected with viruses. They've been infected for 10 years, and we've done nothing about it. We're the stupidest people in the world. And so the phone started ringing. And people asked me, and people asked the people on the network security team and the network monitoring team at the college, what's happening? What shall we do? And we all said, I have no idea. No, we didn't know anything. Our CTO just went and told the board of the directors about this, the, uh, the board at the college, and then called the newspaper and went straight to the newspaper, didn't tell us anything. So people ask me, what about the virus? I said, well, I wish I knew something myself. Um, so here's the story, which was published in the newspaper and went all over the place. We got viruses. That's what viruses look like, in case you wonder. Um, <laughs> And the viruses crawl down the screen like this, and they take snapshots of your data, and they send it to the Russian business network. Um, and the teachers, like me, are ignoring the plain evidence of this and telling students that it's perfectly fine um, and there's nothing to worry about because we're all idiots. Um, and that's the story that went to the newspaper. Until USDN, which is also proud of their role in this, came in to save us. This is the company that found all these viruses, a local company around here. Um, they were hired as a security contractor by the college by the CTO, and they convinced him that we were all full of these viruses and they were going to save us from the virus. But we couldn't find any. Um, this went around the world. This went to IEEE. It went overseas. This was a media sensation at the time, because how could we have been infected for 10 years and done nothing about it and not even noticed? And on it goes. And the CTO called the newspaper before telling anybody and led the photographer through the lab to take pictures of our lab to put in the paper. So he apparently believed that this would result in something good for him, like him being seen as a hero or a whistleblower or some kind of beneficial figure in the world by going straight to the press with this all-important story. Um, so I, we worry about, often worry about outside attacks and often a little bit about insider threats, but now we have diluted insider threats. <laughs> what do you do when the people with high privileges in your networks are just completely insane? So I, I, now the question is, what was he thinking? And I've been spending a whole semester trying to figure this out, <laughs> heavily involved in committee meetings, which are probably better described as lynch mobs, trying to cope with this. And I still don't have an answer. But I knew it was false. And see, what's funny is we couldn't get a copy of the report at all. There was some report from this contractor, supposedly, which was the basis for all this. And we kept demanding it from the contractor and demanding it from the CTO. And we would get nothing about excuses and delays. And the point is, they figured that there was nobody around that would dare stand up against them when you cannot see the evidence and evaluate it. And I, this went on for a while, and I finally said, you know, it is my duty. I can afford to be wrong, and I know they're wrong. So I need to stand up against them even though I can't even see their evidence because that's how this game plays. They hide the evidence, and then nobody dares stand against them because I had my own independent reasons to believe this was garbage. We had replaced the hardware twice. Now, exactly how does the virus get through that? Um, we have antivirus, we have deep freeze, we have a firewall, our network is segmented in VLANs. We were doing a lot better than most colleges. And there was a security audit by professionals years ago, and my students did a security audit of sorts, not a very in-depth one, as part of a CISSP class. And I know that there was nothing that terrible about the network. We found a couple of insecure protocols in use and the usual stuff to fix, but there was no red alert panic data breach on our campus. And also, an important thing to realize is this is not a breach. The CTO kept saying we have to send out letters to everyone that's ever been a student there for the last 10 years and go to the newspaper and everything else because we had a data breach. But if the student machines that they use in the labs have spyware on them, that's not a data breach. 
They use those machines at their own risk like they would at Kinko's. If they put in a credit card number and somebody steals it, that's not our property anyway. A data breach is when they get to our server and they take the data we saved about our students that we collected from them and there was no allegation that that had even happened. But the people involved thought this would be a data breach. And so um, here's the evidence. We couldn't get this report at all. Um, we finally got a partial report on January 31 but it said, see the appendices, where they're supposed to be the packet captures and details to prove that any of this stuff is really on your network. And what happened, the technique here was to do network forensics. They put um, our traffic through some kind of monitoring device, connected it to Alien Vault, and then looked for suspicious traffic there. And anything that matched the signature proved we had certain viruses on the network, supposedly. But we were not allowed to see the raw packets, anything like that. And this, this report was marked proprietary and confidential, and they attempted for months to say, that I couldn't see it and nobody at the campus was allowed to see it because it was proprietary and confidential. And the vice chancellor was just said, wait a minute, we paid for it, how come we can't see it? And <laughs> anyway, later on, the CTO published it in the newspaper. That's what I'm showing you here. So that's what I mean about this whole secret stuff is not a problem for me. The people doing all this stuff publish everything about it in the newspaper. So I don't have to worry about uh, issues like that. So. Um, Anyway, we tried to find this report, um, but what the CTO found out that he was not a hero for going to the newspaper, so he denied talking to the newspaper and said, well, I talked to the FBI instead. And so, here's a question I use in my classes. Brand new students haven't been taught anything, at least by me, about security. I ask him this question. Somebody tells you you've got a whole bunch of viruses on your network, and you're a manager. Who do you talk to? Upper management? Your IT staff? Tell nobody. The FBI? Or the Chronicle? <laughs> and you know, Completely uneducated people can immediately see that these two make no sense at all. You could argue for some of these. But why would you talk to the Chronicle? And why is talking to the FBI better? Somebody at the college should know about this nonsense. We can nip it in the bud. So we finally had meeting after meeting screaming at this guy. He finally gave me a spreadsheet of the infected machines, claiming he had 2,000 infected machines with PII-related events, which means the port number and the IP address is somehow proves that we're infected by a PII-type virus. And by the way, 200 of these are our Unix DNS servers, which were detected with Windows viruses. So what's going on <laughs> is when you get an email and you do a reverse DNS lookup, this was flagging that as evidence that you're in a botnet. I think, although I've still never seen the raw packet captures to say exactly what train wreck happened to cause this nonsense. But we finally got a list from the CTO and I, he said there were 4,589 infected machines. So we went and looked at the 25 that were supposed to have Zeus and they had nothing. It's all garbage. One of them had a log in the McAfee saying Zeus came down and was stopped by the antivirus. But even that's enough to trigger this network forensic device to say we're infected. So this was fantastically stupid. There were no viruses at all. There's nothing to worry about. It's just a waste of everybody's time. So uh, the lynch mobs were getting rid of the CTO with great difficulty. And eventually, um, he was removed from the campus by the police. But he, he put the entire report in the newspaper. And he published a long list explaining how none of this is his fault. There's a gang, the people going to go to his grave saying there are viruses on the network. There's a huge conspiracy. The chancellor, the network administrator, uh, the legal counsel and me are all in a secret conspiracy to cause this, and I'm no good because uh, Abhaxis hacked the college about a year ago, or pretended to. He made a fake hack to try to get me fired, which was proven false at the time, but somehow it's true again when it's time to put it in the newspaper. Anyway, um, so that's what happened there. He finally got removed from the campus, shoved off and told he can't set foot on any of our properties again without explicit permission from the chancellor, which is a very good idea because high privilege insiders that are out of their mind is bad. Anyway, so that, that's our fake breach. Uh, now, let's talk, about, let's talk about a real breach. Um, so if you have real SQL injection like this, where you've got an apostrophe in the URL and you get a SQL uh, syntax error, then as you know, you're vulnerable for a real attack here. A lot of these web pages had it. And so uh, these guys went and used, um, this hacking group went and used uh, SQL map to attack them, and in some of their dumps, they left the commands they used in SQL map, which is kind of friendly of them. Um, so this is Team Ghost Shell. In August of this year, they went and attacked a whole bunch of companies and dumped all the data, and I thought it was a good chance to look at password security. So here's their political explanation of why they're doing it or something, which I don't care much about. Here's the people they hacked. This CIA services is not the CIA I was thinking of. 
This is like a housing authority someplace in some small town. Huh? So here's the categories of password storage. This is beyond belief. This was like so bad, I don't think I have polite words for it. Um, so these guys have got, pat this is Buchanan bond, word, bond Exchange, and the passwords are stored in plain text, and most of them are Buchanan Bond 1. So they're even all the same. And that, you'll see more of this. Here's passwords all stored in plain text for this company, Reason Associate, a law company, and almost all of them are the same. K-Law, obviously there's a default, and nobody ever even changed the default. Um, and here's Sparkland, a company that sells car parts, and all the passwords are just Sparkland. So that's, that's kind of worse than I would imagine. Um, anyway, uh, here's B Forward, and so these guys got hacked. Now they, this is a breach. These is customer data, thousands of them, and they've dumped out the names of these people and their addresses. That's a breach. Now, if this was America, you'd have to go through breach notification and all that jazz. I don't know if these people will have to do it wherever they are. Um, so more plain text passwords here. At least they're not all the same, but they're like four letters and such, so that's not terribly good. The next thing, there's people that decide they're going to obfuscate the passwords <laughs> with base 64. So that's what this nonsense is, right? And they tell you, in case you're concerned, that they employ commercially reasonable security methods. <laughs> so apparently that is commercially reasonable. And so obviously you can just go online and reverse those. That's nothing but that. So the next thing is MD5 or SHA-1. This is real hashing. So here's um, the dump from MIT. Uh, not the main MIT website, but uh, one of the subsidiary websites at MIT. Here's all their MD5s, and this one, even the people who dumped it were able to crack that and turn that into Hiawatha, and I was able to just crack any of it by just using an online tool. You know, Reversing an MD5 hash is relatively simple. You cannot do it in all cases, but you can do it if the password is in any list of known passwords by just doing a reverse lookup. Um, so MIT, by the way, has a very good form to report security incidents, and I did. I don't know if they did anything about it, but at least there's a form to use. Um, so MySQL 323 is another password hash. Uh, uh, you'll see places, and you can crack that one with Kane. Um, and SHA-1 is another one commonly used, um, which is hardly any better than MD5, just a little bit. You can crack those online, too. And as you see, this is not an enormously obvious password, Ben246907, you know, but that cracks with a, a free online password cracker. I don't even need GPUs and Hashcat or any of that fancy stuff. Um, and here's MySQL 5. They've got their own special format. And WordPress has their format with a P in it. And the interesting thing is, um, here's these things I think are Shaw ones, and he cracked Chicken Marine and Chicken 2. But uh, the last one's easily cracked with an online tool as well. So those are password hashes. So why bother hashing your passwords if they're that easy to crack? And um, here's the CIA with their breach. So let's talk about why this is a bad idea. Um, this is a nice article listing all the types of hashes and salts that are used in common software. There's only about six or seven typical password hashes used. And um, they are all worthless because they're all designed modern. You've got to use bcrypt or some similar routine. Uh, the problem is these passwords are designed to crack fast. That's the point here is what I'm looking for. These, these hash functions are designed to be fast, so you can calculate the SHA-1 hash of a 10 gigabyte file without waiting forever, and that's not what you want for passwords. You want it to be slow. So um, you've got to use one of these, bcrypt is one, and there are other routines that just do many, many, many reps of hashes, like 5,000 SHA-1s or 5,000 SHA-512s like this MacBook Air does. And then it takes a long time to calculate each hash, like 50 milliseconds, which is no problem for me to log in, but it makes it essentially impossible to make those huge reverse dictionaries that you need to crack these passwords. Everybody should be doing that, and nobody is, as far as I know. With the only company I know that is doing this is Cloudflare. By the way, and I guess we're in the kind of place I can ask this, how many people, your company is actually using a proper password hash like bcrypt? One, two, two. Okay, well, that's interesting. That's, I'm glad some people are doing it. Of course, you, they probably wouldn't all tell me if they were doing it. But anyway, it is a shame if you're using the SHA-1 or MD5 or any normal hash routine for this because they're not intended for password storage, and it's very much wasting your time. And since you're likely to get breached one way or another, you do, it's good to have defense in depth, and your second layer is essentially useless. So I'd like to try to demonstrate this next attack, but first I'm going to talk about it. This why I found this. I did this a year or two ago. I mean, IPv6 router advertisements. And let me just review this. If you folks aren't into IPv6, which you should be, but anyway, 
Here's the old attack, all the way back to 2011. Um, DHCP and IP version 4, you boot up your machine, it asks for an IP address, and the router says use list 1, that's the end of the transaction. But in IP version 6, you typically do it with router advertisements, which is a push process. The router sends out these router advertisement packets to every machine on the network, and every one of them has to immediately join that network. So the router makes all the clients work. And that's the root of the problem. If you send a lot of router advertisements on the network, the clients have to do a lot of work joining all those networks. The router advertisement goes to FFO2 colon colon 1, which is the link local mu uh, multicast to all nodes. And it contains a prefix. And so every device that receives this will have to make up the second half of their address and join this network, which is not too bad. But if you send thousands of them on the network, it can be a lot of work for those devices. And Windows machines are fantastically inefficient at this, and also FreeBSD. Um, they can, Windows can only make five of these addresses per second. So if you send more than five router advertisements per second, it drives the CPU to 100%. If you send them fast, it bids a huge backlog, and your machine is at 100% for hours jogging, digging through them. So it's a serious denial of service vulnerability. And uh, that's, it has no effect on Ubuntu Linux, no effect on the Mac. It just configures the first 10 addresses or so and then ignores all the rest with no apparent damage to the machine. Um, and that's the previous attack, Flood Router 6. Now, a month or two ago, um, the German group that made this came out with a revised attack, the new RA Flood. <laughs> so um, the new RA Flood just puts more work in each router advertisement. You can advertise multiple routers with one packet. It's uh, permitted by the protocol. So you just put 17 routes in the packet, uh, 17 prefixes and 18 routes. So each one of these packets is like 20 or 30 of the previous one. That makes the, that makes the attack more powerful. And this one is exciting. I expected it to use up some CPU, but that's not what happens. It kills machines dead. It kills the Mac dead. It kills Windows 8 dead. Windows 7 and Server 2008 R2 have an update Microsoft finally put out after about two years after doing this, called the IPv6 readiness update. And that doesn't really protect you entirely, but it causes the machine, instead of having a huge backlog that will take hours to chew through, it just freezes completely during the attack. And when the attack stops, it recovers quickly. So it's not completely protecting it from the attack, but it's somewhat better. Um, by the way, this one on a wireless network, we were able to crash an iPad 3, but it wasn't too reliable. So I decided not to try to demonstrate it here. But um, anyway. Uh, I put up a lot of videos of these things happening, and you can get all these on my website, samsclass.info. We made videos, and, and uh, for mitigation, see, normally I do the demo and then talk about this, but this is like a rock performance where you burn instruments at the end. I'm going to destroy every machine. So I have to finish with all the PowerPoint before I attempt this. So if you want to prevent this, you can turn off IPv6. That's, of course, kind of a retro motion, but it does, of course, protect you. You can turn off router discovery, which means your machine no longer auto configures addresses, which is going to protect you from this attack, although it will prevent you from using router advertisements. You can get a switch with RA Guard. This is the Cisco solution. Modern Cisco switches can be configured to only permit one network port to give, put out RAs and not take them from anywhere else. And that will help. You can also use a firewall to block the undesirable packet, um, a firewall to block ones that come from unauthorized addresses. And I can say, Microsoft's IPv6 readiness update provides some protection, but it is only available for Windows 7 and Server 2008 R2. They have not released it for any other version, but it, it's, only, it's only about a month old. So let me attempt this demo. And if you'll bear with me, I may have to spend a minute plugging in some cables here. The switch is on. This thing, did this thing lose its power? It's gone down. Yeah, it just goes to sleep a little bit. Goes to sleep. Yeah. Now it doesn't appear to be waking up. Let's see if the power cables come out or something. Let me bring my E up. My E is up. And, I'll, and we need to get the projector. Where's the projector? Here's the projector. Good. OK. So uh, we should have a Windows 8 target here. And we do. Good. Let me get my second projector up. That's all right. Now I'm going to put it up on the white screen on top of the other stuff. That'll work. Nah, it will be. That's good. It's coming up. All right. And um, get everything. They are not all connected to this network, however. Let's see. Uh, we need the Mac connected to the switch. All right. And we need, uh, there must be a fourth cable. The ad is connected. The attacker is not connected. Here's the fourth cable. OK. All right. 
They told me that I shouldn't add a demo on such short notice, so nobody can give me help setting up, but I did it anyway. So please bear with me. Things will be a little unprofessional here. All right. Oh, good. That's coming up. All right. So let's get this thing up. All right. Good, good. This is good. You can see Windows 8. And let's try and make it a little taller. This thing. Good. Ah, that's perfect. Okay. So this is a glorious Windows 8. It doesn't need to be very professional or anything because the effect is not subtle. So let me bring up uh, ifconfig. EN3, good. So I'm going to watch my inter uh, the ifconfig of my Ethernet adapter, which is a gigabit adapter. This, by the way, is an extremely impractical attack. We had a lot of work to make it go. It's very, you have to have very fast network for these dramatic effects to happen. So we've got an enterprise class gigabit switch, a gigabit USB interface on this a Mac. This is a 100 megabit attacker, though. The attacker doesn't really have to put out an awful lot of packets to flood the network. But it took us quite a few tries. So the Windows 8 is up. Um, the Viata is up. Good. This, by the way, I wanted to mention um, Mr. Yang here figured this out. He told me, yeah, we ran the attack and it would work, then we tried again, it would fail, it would work. We were doing this for a week, and he said, you have to have a router for the flood to kill the, the, win the Windows of uh, the Mac. And I said, why? And he couldn't explain why in a way I could understand, but it's true. I tried to ignore it because I couldn't understand it, but I tried it, and when you have a router in the network, this attack works, and when you take it out, it no longer works. I don't know why. I would appreciate it if some genius out there would help figure out why. Anyway, so that the router advertisements are not coming from the router. They're coming from this attacker on the side. Yeah? Uh, no, this is a layer two switch. But it does have to be an enterprise class switch. Cheap switches don't work. Which real IPv6 router advertising as well? Yes. You need a second router advertising normal router advertisements. Because my router is up. It's advertising normal router advertisements. It's Viata. And that's what this 2001 DBH stuff is. These two addresses here are automatically configured by that router, which is doing what you should do on an IPv6 network. It's just advertising one prefix so people will join that network. Now, this E attacker is going to send thousands of them. Let me just get it going here. CD, TH, OK, dot slash flood, router 6, router 26, pardon me, ETH0. OK, the flood is going to be going right now. And see, it's coming in. Now this machine is configuring a lot of extra addresses. And all we have to do now is wait. Let me see if I can start this. This thing here is kind of fun. This is my processes. All right. So what happens, the 8 usually goes first in about 25 seconds. Aha, the Mac just died. I don't know why my Windows 8 didn't die on command, but the Mac is dead. The, it, now, I don't have the addresses. This is ifconfig, and it's now giving me strange error messages. Ah, oh, there went the Mac. The glorious Mac roosting at the, the router. So that's what I wanted to show you. Now I, now I think. And now, if you try to go here, you see my Mac is toast. I can't bring this app up. And if by about now, if I hit this, I get nothing. This thing, if I hit the Start button, this I'm getting this now. If I wait another 30 seconds or so, I won't even get this. I'm not going to be able to shut the thing down. If you keep this up for another minute or so, I won't even see this. And the only thing you can do is hold down the button and give it a dead power off for both devices, as long as this goes on. So I would like, you now this is brand new. We only got it working reliably like two days ago. So I have no clue how it works, really. I understand why it burdens the, how the machine has to join a lot of networks, but I don't see any reason for them to crash. There must be a buffer overflow or something. You got a question back there? Yeah. Uh, unplugging the network cable will stop the attack. Oh, let me stop the attack. I'll just hit Control C here. And when you do, your Mac is still not back to normal. You're still going to have to power it down the hard way. It'll let this machine up, though. If you get the attack going, it'll just come up and down and up and down and up and down. Now, now this thing can come back up. But of course, unplugging the cable or stopping the attack will stop the damage as far as it's gone. But you see here, I'm still not able to open this app. Some things still work. 
but this activity monitor will not come up. And I've never seen the Mac recover from this. And by the way, here's something that I thought my must be nuts too. You have to restart the Mac twice <laughs> to get it back to normal. <laughs> and when I did that, I thought, I'm losing my mind. This can't be true. But I realized you can't do a normal shutdown now. You can only do an abnormal shutdown. You have to do a real power up and then a proper shutdown to really get this thing back to a normal state. Um, and by the way, you have to, other routers, you have to reboot the router pretty often. But anyway, um, that's what I wanted to show you. I'm glad it worked. Any more questions out there? Yeah? How many times a second do you each time? Um, each dot on my screen is, it looks like about 2,000 a second. Um, and by the way, I wanted to tell you something else since I don't know if I'm out of time yet or what, 2.34? The time man is not screaming at me. The, um, uh, if you do this, OK, um, if you do this on a wired network, like I said, when, when we were having trouble, I tried using a crossover cable, nothing but the attacker and the target, and it totally didn't work. You have to add devices to a wired network for this to work. On a wireless network, we were able to make it freeze the iPad 3, more or less. The, mini, the iPad mini is the most vulnerable version. That will even crash completely sometimes, but mostly it just uses up all the CPU, and it's not too dramatic. But if you add a second wireless device to the network, it waters down the attack and it stops hurting it. So you need, I don't know why, but that's the truth. Yeah, that's right. You've got to have a fast network, 802.11n at 5 gigahertz. And you can burden the iPad 3 and the mini iPad heavily, although you cannot crash them reliably like this. Um, so I don't know if this could possibly be exploitable. I kind of doubt it. But maybe there's some kind of buffer overflowing. I, why would it crash? I can see how it would get busy and stop responding, but why would it crash, like Windows 8? Anyway, um, any other questions? Yeah? What's that? No, that would be wonderful. So you use a kernel debugger on the Windows machine. That would be great, although it's going to die during the attack. And I'm not competent to do that. I would love to partner with somebody that is competent to do that and figure out why this thing is really crashing. Or, you know, I put up the videos and the instructions so you can set it up. Um, it's getting kind of expensive right now. So far, we need a $600 switch to do this uh, reliably. Although Windows 8 is a pushover. You can kill Windows 8 with almost anything. You can use cheap switch for that. Uh, it's killing the Mac that's hard. For that, you need the $600 switch so far. Um, yeah? Well, yeah, see, that's a good question. He said, um, did they, the reporters do any fact checking on that CCSF thing? And they didn't, of course. And I tried to contact them, and they wouldn't even talk to me um, because the CTO told them that I was unqualified and incompetent and I was part of the conspiracy. That's why I got the t shirt. Um, and uh, <laughs> so it's, the reporters don't seem to care. No one wants to print a retraction. I finally wrote an article for 2600 about it because I kind of would like to have some print record because I know in a few years I'm going to see this in textbooks as an example of a virus infection because the only thing the print record shows is it's all true. And then eventually, six months later, the CTO is fired for no apparent reason. So the truth just can't get out there. Nobody cares. Um, it's kind of irritating. But I tell security conferences about it anyway. All right, well, I guess I ought to get out of room for the next speaker. Oh, there's one way back there. What's up? Well, he says that this, this um, addressing happens in the kernel, and when you exhaust the kernel resources, you expect Windows 8 to go down. But why doesn't it? control that. I mean, why would it let it just use up everything and crash? Why doesn't it just have some kind of signal saying, I'm full, put everything on a queue or something? That's what I don't get. I can see being busy. What's, what's that? Memory allocation in the kernel can't do that? Oh, so the kernel doesn't, doesn't, all right, I'm, this is good. Right, so, so it's common when you burden the kernel too much that it does not control the resources. It just lets them run past where they can get it crashes. So that probably means this is not exploitable then, right? It's not a controllable attack.
That's what I think. Probably can't really get control of the machine, but, but anyway, it'd be interesting to check it out. And as I say, I would not worry about it. We had great trouble making it work at all. This is not going to happen to you in a coffee house or on an ordinary network. Only if you have a really fast network will it happen. But when we move to 801, 811 AC and AD, it might become practical to do this much damage on a wireless network. Anyway, I better stop. I think we have to move on to the next talk. Thank you. Right. He has rather more stuff to shut down. Than